I'm Danielle Muir. I'm one of the, the Scottish officers from the, the BDS, the British Dragonfly Society. And I'm here today with Chris Jones and Eva Bishop from the Beaver Trust. And we're going to have a chat today about beavers and dragonflies because obviously dragonflies love wetlands. They need water for, for breeding and beavers create wetlands. So it seems like a marriage, a marriage made in heaven. So we're going to have a chat about how beavers benefit dragonflies um, and just find out a bit more about the, the project that you've been working on in Cornwall and how your beavers are faring down there and how dragonflies are faring down there. Uh, okay, I'm Chris Jones from Beaver Trust. And I'm Eva Bishop and really looking forward to learning a little bit from you about um, dragonflies and damselflies and what we might expect to see at a beaver wetland. Great stuff. Well, maybe we can start off if you could tell me a bit about the Beaver Trust. When, when were you set up um, and, and what, what, what were your aims? Well, I think uh, our aims are to uh, restore beavers back to Britain uh, properly. Uh, um, at the moment, they are around in a few uh, fence trials and they're around on a small number of rivers. And we really need to get this, this species back into a lot more rivers across the country um, because they have most incredible... Um, uh, advantages for us in uh, terms of biodiversity and also in terms of uh, water management uh, for flooding and for droughts. Uh, they have great water cleaning capacity and uh, we're still finding out about this but they also have great capacity to store carbon as well uh, in their creation of wetlands. We've been around for about a year and um, just a few of us in a small British new charity and um, we really, amongst other things, we want to do more for nature restoration in the face of the climate and ecological emergencies. And having seen what has happened at Chris's Cornwall Beaver Project, which is just five acres of enclosure, it's an absolutely stunning wetland. And if we start to imagine that across loads of the river catchments in Britain, you get a really amazing and believable story of hope for nature recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're miracle workers, really, beavers, aren't they? Yes. In fact, away from my dragonfly job, I run Persia Wildlife, and I, I, one of the things I do is I run beaver tours, and I had a beaver tour last night. Mm. We went to two different locations. We went to, to Banff Estate, which you'll, you'll know about, and um, there is, I used, I, I used, prior to this current post, I worked as a ranger, and one of the sites that I used to keep an eye on was the Catran Trail, and the Catran Trail runs through Banff Estate. Mm -hmm. And I can remember 15 odd years ago, that drainage ditch that ran through, ran through the estate, the water moved through there quickly, there was no wildlife associated with that drainage ditch. Mm -hmm. They introduced the beavers. The beavers obviously built some dams, they wanted to raise the water level, and so they've got a system of probably about nine or ten dams along that drainage ditch now. And um, when I'm there in the summer, I see lots and lots of different damselflies, different dragonflies. The wetland that they've they've recreated is just absolutely phenomenal. The, the plants, the orchids, the the bird life, the the invertebrates that live there. Um, it's just such a difference from before and after. The, the beavers, the beavers being introduced. So, um, yeah, from from so many points of view, it's they're just amazing creatures, aren't they? Mm. Mm. Uh, it, incredible. Yeah. From the from the dragonfly and damselfly perspective, have you seen any red listed or new species that you didn't know, that, that weren't there before at Banff specifically? At Banff, no. Um, here in this in this area of Scotland, we don't find any particularly rare species, unfortunately. Um, so at Banff, I've seen large red damselflies, I've seen emerald damselflies, common blue damselflies, and Paul, um, this, the the owner, he sent me pictures of common hawkers and black darters. So none of, the, none, none of those species is rare, but it's just an added. Um, just an added beauty to the site, just seeing the seeing the dragonflies. And obviously those dragonflies are a really important part of the, the food chain. They're also great for us in that they 
feed on midges. Now, if you've been to Scotland, you'll know that midges <laughs> are lots and lots of them. So anything that feeds on midges and mosquitoes, you know, so they've got a good pest control role as well. Um, so so we, we don't have that rare species data, but it would be absolutely brilliant if we could get somebody set up to come and have, uh, come and have a look at, at your dragonflies in, in Cornwall. Um, so I'm sure lots of people fell in love with, with the beavers in Cornwall after being featured on, on Springwatch. Um, and you've been carrying out quite a lot of, of surveys of monitoring. You've not had any, if, any sort of scientific dragonfly surveys, but can you tell me about how you've seen any changes in dragonflies since, since the beavers were, were introduced? Um, how many years ago was it? Five years ago? Three years. Three years ago. Yeah. Uh, and my impressions are um, a little bit hazy, let's say, on detail, because I, uh, I am not in any way uh, uh, knowledgeable about dragonflies. My, my impression is that there are just many more, uh, and we see different ones. And um, uh, so it, it, it's, it's uh, diversity and abundance has mm -hmm. definitely gone up. And I guess because there is so much more suitable uh, uh, habitat for, um, uh, for, for larvae, I guess, uh, uh, yeah. larval growth. Um, because there the, are the, uh, a large number now of uh, uh, warm, shallow ponds, as well as some deeper, cooler areas as well. And it is just chock-a-block with life. Uh, what, one of the things that... Sorry, Well, I was just going to say, that one of the things that took me a while to work out was uh, the reason for the great uptick in uh, biodiversity. And it, it just hit me one day, well, obviously, uh, the, the water slows down so much behind the dams that um, algae can begin to form. And, and there's a lot of algae behind those dams. And of course, algae is the bottom end of any food, uh, any aquatic food chain. So, uh, uh, that is just more of everything. Uh -huh. And uh, dragonflies do like fairly shallow, war shallow ponds that can warm up because that speeds up the the growth of the growth of the, the larvae. And th the way the beavers will have um, produced the dams, built the dams, and have made sort of canals. And you'll have quite a variety of of different wetlands. So you'll have some shallower pools than others. So there's quite a variety in different species of like the different conditions in, in, in the different areas. So that's probably why you've seen the, the increase in diversity as well as the increase in yeah. number. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's fantastic. And one of the things that beavers are great for is, is climate change mitigation. And dragonflies are, are quickly affected by warming, warming temperatures. And certainly in the last 20 years, we've seen uh, species species moving north and um, if you look at an atlas, we, BDS produced a wonderful atlas in 2014 about um, uh, dragonfly distribution. Um, if you compare that to an atlas 30 years ago, it's just amazing to see how many species are, uh, how far north that they've, they've come in that time. Um, uh, one example that I've come across here in, in Perthshire is the northern damselfly is quite a rare damselfly. It's only found in three locations um, in Scotland at the end, edge of the Cairngorms National Park. And it's quite a specialised species. Um, and it's only in the last few years that the azure damselfly, uh, which 20 years ago was, was about 50, 50 miles south of where it's currently found, has come into the locations where the northern damselfly is, and it's a far more of a, a generalist species. Mm. And it's go, it, there's no doubt it's going to have some impact on the, on the northern damselfly. Um, the, the climate change mitigation that, that beavers produce as a result of, of putting in the dams, creating the wetlands, have you got, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, how, does, how does that work? Uh, I think the, the critical thing is, is that, that the, the animals store so much water. You know, that there's now a, 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 a bit of a rough estimate, but there's now something like 
uh, 3,000 cubic meters more water on that site pretty much permanently, um, you know, a site that's only 200 meters long. This is a lot of water. Yeah. And, um, and it's not just above ground, it's underground too, you know, and th th this, this, is, this is really significant. And we're talking about just 200 meters. Imagine instead of 200 meters, this was 2,000 kilometers. Uh, of uh, a, a river or 20,000 kilometers of river. This country has got something like 300,000 kilometers of stream on it. Um, and if we're all storing water in, in all the headwaters, I do not know what the proportion of headwaters is to, to uh, main rivers, but if all, if all of our headwaters uh, uh, were hosting this animal and keeping that much of the water back, it has a big effect on the hydro hydrology uh, of, of any system anywhere. And of course, wildlife needs water. And uh, if you haven't got it, you won't have the wildlife. And, and um, what, what, once you get it there, uh, you will see a massive uptick in, in every sort of wildlife that is going, including our dragonflies. So they have a, they have a, a really important role as a consequence of that in sort of reducing flooding downriver and also, which is great for dragonflies too, is during periods of drought, they obviously keep the water there in the system rather than in, in the example I was talking about earlier, rather than the water just flowing through in that ditch from one side of, of the country to the other. And um, they, they're keeping it there, which is benefiting everything really, benefiting a whole host of wildlife, benefiting us, um, and definitely benefiting the, the dragonflies. Uh, without shadow of a doubt, um, I I actually think uh, as a farmer that I'm much more worried about drought than I'm about floods now. Right. Because uh, you, you can always uh, sort of walk away from a flood uh, uh, to a degree. You can't walk away from a drought. You know, they 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 they, they just tend to be uh, a ramify right through a system. And by having all this extra water there, we really really reduce the effects of that certainly all the, all the aquatic species but also if you're farming there it means you've got water you can pump out to uh, irrigate a field you know irrigate mm -hmm. pasture or irrigate potatoes or whatever you want if you haven't got the water there you're stuffed yeah and have you seen a difference in um the number and so sort of diversity of bird species since since the dams have been produced uh, without shadow of a doubt, I think we're on eight new bird records there now since uh, since the beavers uh, started, um, and we had a a, a chap called Ben McDonald, um, who's a very famous uh, birder. He he just recently wrote a book called Rebirding, and um, he was terribly excited because he saw willow tits, which are apparently this country's uh, fastest declining woodland bird. Uh -huh. um, we, uh, I understand it, that down to fewer than 100 pairs uh, in this country now, breeding pairs. Uh, I, I, I hope I haven't got that wrong and, and um, uh, uh, made, made a grossly uh, underestimate, but it, it, it's, a, it's a very, 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 very red-listed bird. I mean, it, it's, I think, nearly 90% down on its uh, sort of numbers yeah. from 1970, just falling like a stone. And the, these uh, beavers create the habitat that they need to live. Um, and there we were on our side. I'd never seen, seen one here before. And he said, my God, that, that's, that's a, a, a uh, willow tit. And he was very excited. Yeah, I would be too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've never seen one. Yeah. Of course, the great thing about beavers and their habitat creation is that it's on an area we don't otherwise use. We don't want to build on rivers and streams. We don't need to farm right up to the edge. So it's an ideal place to create more habitat. Mm. Okay, I've got my um, Team Dragonfly sticker, which I'll send, I'll send you some Team Dragonfly stickers. Thanks Brilliant. very much. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Um, what else should we chat about? Um, well, for I found the report from the West German beaver study. I don't know if you guys have seen that, um, but there were some absolutely staggering figures from it. So it was done a little while ago, um, and they found that um, they compared 
beaver ponds, it's in the Alps region, had beaver ponds, previous beaver ponds that were out of use for one to three years and non-beaver areas. And they, uh-huh. um, the non-beaver areas had four species of dragonfly recorded. With beaver ponds, it jumps to 29. And even the relic beaver ponds were seven species, more better oh, than at all. But 29 is, a, is amazing, isn't it? That is, that is amazing. Wait, what's that study called? And I'll try and find it. Or would you be able to email it to me if you got a copy? Yeah, I'll definitely share it with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Thanks. Amazing, yeah, the, and, and it's, I think it's, if you look up beavers and dragonflies, it's the first thing that comes up. But it's um, a little bit, I think it's 2012, possibly. Right. Um, but absolutely, and it's, the, the whole point there was that the diversity of habitat that beavers create means yeah. um, mm. any developmental stage is catered for. And so you've got all the right habitats that you need for life to thrive and you've got the insect life and you've got the, you know, the carnivores can thrive there as well as... <laughs> as well, as well it sounds like beavers are doing naturally and at minimal cost to, to, to anybody. What what we do at our hotspots, so our, our dragonfly hotspots, we have ten acro- ten of them across Scotland, and more in the rest of the UK as well. Um, and they're obviously great places to see dragonflies. They're places to sort of engage with communities, and we do all sorts of um, training and guided walks and so on there. And we also have volunteer days. And one of the one of the things we do is certainly one of our hotspots called Flanders Moss. We've been over the past few years. We've been Sort of digging, digging new ponds um, as other ponds sort of start to fill in. It's on a peatland, so they fill in with sphagnum, which is what we want. It's great for dragonflies. Um, so what we are doing is we're, we're making sure we have a number of ponds at different stages of succession. And that's what the beavers do. That's what the beavers do now. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah and, and the, the data is that we've, we've lost a million ponds, or a million ponds have been destroyed mm-hmm. since the end of World War II. So every mm-hmm. wetland's precious. So it's precious for dragonflies. It's precious for birds. It's precious for mm-hmm. it's precious for us. Mm-hmm. The, the water's mm-hmm. there, and mm-hmm. um, so I think it's a win-win situation having beavers. Imagine if we had beavers in all the places we had before. The habitat connectivity was there. Mm. It's really interesting, you know, that the, the the beaver thing it gives you your uh, nature recovery network for nothing. Yeah. Bang, yeah. And I think that um, if uh, something we uh, are really lobbying quite hard for with DEFRA here is that um, we have a compulsory 20 metre uh, waterway margins or buffers where we only allow natural processes. So maybe some grazing, but no cultivation, no chemistry uh, uh, and... Um, and leave it natural processes. So when the beavers turn up, the farmer isn't losing anything uh, because he's being paid for his buffer for yep. its environmental reasons. And I, I just think it would be such a winner of a, of a policy if they if they brought that in. Yeah, uh, that's something that I I speak about quite frequently on on my trips because we have. Um, I live in an area where it's prime agricultural land, and. Um, if they're having a problem with the beavers, they don't actually have to carry out mitigation. They can get a license. And 87 beavers were shot here in, mm. in Tayside mm. last, last year through license from SNA. Mm. Um, and some of that's obviously um, because they make their lodges in the riverbanks and then some of the banks collapse. Mm. And I understand farmers not being very happy with that. But if we had that 20 metre buffer zone, that wouldn't happen. Um, mm buffer zone would work to collect silt coming from the coming from the field it would collect the yeah. the chemical panel from the fertilizer yeah. i would love to see that i mean mm. that's sort of almost number one in my book for yeah. for um working with farmers to achieve mm. working with death to achieve mm. yeah absolutely and i think that tayside has shown that and we know from other experience that beavers aren't mm. with their challenges but that these can be managed if you've got a good yeah. management framework and yeah. policy in place and yeah. uh, better education and understanding of what it takes mm. inside beavers again, because mm. they haven't been here for hundreds of years now. So mm. it's going to take a bit of getting used to, but those are manageable. The and, there's, mm. yeah, 
and there's all the obviously the, all the positive ecotourism benefits, which yeah. um, I don't know. Have you have you got lots of people coming to visit the, the project there in Cornwall? It, it, in normal times, yes, yeah. yeah, lots and lots. So those people will come and they'll stay and have a holiday and they'll stay in the local B and Bs and mm. accommodation. They'll eat at local restaurants and so on. So they bring they do bring a lot of money into the economy, yeah. as well as all their amazing work for ecology, for climate mitigation. Yeah, mm. yeah. We th we think um, the cost of bringing beavers back across England would be less than 1% of our annual flood budget. Gosh. Yeah, I do, it, do it on a, like a 10 year program and, and uh, do it fairly systematically. Mm. Uh, and that, that, you know, it's such a small amount of money. Mm. And that includes having people trained up to, to manage them and, you know, a, a, a volunteer network and all, all, all the stuff that you'd need to put in place. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very, very small bill. Yeah. And we should do it. It's mindset change. And that's the really <laughs> fascinating thing. And that's why we are, it's part one of the reasons that Beaver Trust exists, is to try and help people understand the place to come to if you've got questions on it and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anywhere one can go, Danielle, um, to look up dragonfly species and things like that? What, have you got some pages we can link to on our website and things? It'd be really interesting to try and. Um, uh, collaborate on the education side of things and make sure people Definitely. know where to go to, to yeah. learn more. Um, about dragonflies, we've got so we do have some education uh, resources on the website. So if you go to the the BDS website and then and then go to resources, I would imagine. So yeah, go on the website, look for resources. We have it's a whole host of stuff on there. Yeah, brilliant. I think dragonflies and dragonflies a little bit like beavers. They really capture the hearts and minds. Mm. <laughs> I think I think that's right. Beautiful and yeah. they're exciting and they're you know they're a great way to connect with nature. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the great things that I love about the beavers as well is, I mean, dragonflies have been around since before the time time of the dinosaurs. They've been around for mm. 200, 200 million years and they've not really mm. changed that much. The design hasn't changed that much in that time because they're well adapted to what they do. Though they are a lot smaller than they used to be. I would probably be a bit nervous of meeting a a dragonfly with a, a 90 centimeter wingspan but um but yeah but i think like the dragonflies when when you see when the bee when you see the beavers it's almost like it takes you back to mm. a wilder time mm. and I, th I think i think we need that for our soul and the, the way we live yeah. today yeah definitely dragonflies and beavers can both help help with that yeah mm. Yeah, they add to I think uh, that that sense of wildness, and particularly when you get some some really big ones uh, uh, zooming over the pond or yeah. in the grassland by the side. Uh, something that's it struck me is it's not just around the ponds themselves now; they're coming out from the ponds, and um, we've got some quite uh, nice, uh, very herb-rich, flower-rich uh, uh, grassland very close by, and boy, you see the the the, the uh, um, dragonflies hawking out over that and not just one or two you know dozens of them oh uh, wonderful uh, uh, and you know I, I, as i said i saw this this huge one eating another one we thought they might have been mating there on the ground and, and you could see this thorn sort of bluish on on top and then uh, eventually uh, it got up it didn't like having its picture taken it flew away and then there was one right below it without a head anymore you know <laughs> Yes, the cannibalism is nothing to a dragonfly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, show, I'll show that picture. Mm. Quite possibly. Uh, I, I think. I think, I think that was it. But with the, uh, a picture was taken. So as soon as I can, I'll get that to you to to uh, to show you. Um, okay. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. No, they, well, I think we should get fun. a field trip organised <laughs> for the BDS. Yeah. Definitely, de definitely be really welcome. Uh, and um, if you do have a local volunteer who could come and have a quick survey now, that would whet your appetite, I'm sure, for uh, yeah. future work. Yeah, well, definitely. I'll look into that and get back to you as as, as soon as I know. Yeah, okay. Bye. Fabulous. Thanks for Brilliant. Much. Thank you so much for inviting us to talk about beavers and dragonflies. Really excited. Yeah. Oh.
You're welcome. It was lovely, lovely to meet you both and to, to have a chat. But we've just got our aims and objectives are pretty much very similar. Um, mm. Getting people to love these wonderful, these wonderful mm. wildlife that um, that can be rare, but we hope to make become a bit more. Fun. Exactly, exactly. Because someone put it really nicely the other day. They said that rather than having a, a nature reserve, you can go and visit. Wouldn't it be better just to live in a nature reserve? And, you know, and we can have this all over the place. We really can. And we'd be far happier people if that was the case, I think. Undoubtedly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very Brilliant. much. Thank, thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Daniel. You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye now. Right, bye.